Good morning, I'm Christopher Sayer, filling in for Harley Schlanger with your daily update for August 8th, 2023. Now, coming up on August 22nd through the 24th, there will be a BRICS Summit. And over the last two weeks, in typical divide and conquer style, British-controlled media outlets Reuters and Bloomberg, the poisonous alliance of the City of London and Wall Street, took the point to issue numerous articles insisting that the upcoming summit in Johannesburg, South Africa, would not agree to the expansion of that five-nation group, Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. There are now 22 nations from across the planet that have formally applied to join the BRICS, and another 20 or so who have expressed interest in joining. But this will not happen, Reuters and Bloomberg reported, because Brazil and India in particular were against any such expansion, in both cases citing anonymous officials as their sources. But the media campaign has backfired big time. In fact, President of Brazil himself, the President of Brazil himself, Lula da Silva, told the press midweek that Brazil was in favor of expansion. And on August 3rd, India's foreign ministry spokesperson, Arindam Bagchi, stressed that the claims about his country being against the expansion of the BRICS were also false. Now, numerous media outlets in the BRICS nations also saw right through the British attempt to play divide and conquer and expose the operation. Russia's Sputnik reported that Brazil and India have effectively refuted allegations that recently emerged in mainstream media about them opposing the expansion of the BRICS. The agency quoted journalist and commentator Adriel Casanta saying, so it is not about the schism because the BRICS already made a commitment and a decision to move forward with adding new members, not only during this summit, but in the coming future. But it is more about the Western attempts to try and destroy the grouping, which is posing a serious threat or I would say a concern to the Western hegemony in order to maintain this hegemony in the future. Cassanta added that there is a de facto hybrid war waged by the West against BRICS because the ultimate goal of BRICS is to be the final milestone in the long attempt by global South leaders like Kwame Nkrumah to break away from neocolonialism. Well, that is the life work of Lyndon LaRouche to create the conditions for a new just world economic order where the whole world, especially the global south, can break away from neocolonialism. Now in that light, Sergei Glaziev, the renowned Russian economist, who's now the Commissioner for Integration and Macroeconomics within the Eurasian Economic Commission, the executive body of the Eurasian Economic Union, Sergei Glaziev just published on his Telegram channel the uh, a Russian language version of the June 7th Executive Intelligence Review memo, LaRouche Essentials for Transition to a New International Financial System. And we'll put the link uh, to this article in the bio. In his introduction to the document, document, Glaziev says, Helga LaRouche, who sent this memorandum, continues the work of her late husband, a great thinker economist, who more than a quarter of a century ago predicted the inevitable collapse of the dollar monetary system. LaRouche's famous crocodile, that is the triple curve, the diverging curves of global GDP growth and the capitalization of the U.S. financial system going up through the heavens, it has only opened its jaws wider since then devouring real values in exchange for the issuance of unsecured dollars. This document also lays out how the sanctions against Russia and other nations have used the dollar as a weapon, attempting to keep nations down, which has failed miserably. Instead, it lays out the solution for a new financial architecture that will instead lift up all nations, including the United States, I might add. Now, there are three critical criteria that are laid out in the document that the new system and its currency must meet. Number one, total separation between the new currency and participating national currencies on the one side 
and the predatory toxic dollar on the other side, i.e. no free convertibility between them. Exchange and capital controls become essential tools to achieve that result. For the United States, this means a return to Glass-Steagall, the 1933 FDR Glass-Steagall banking law, with its strict separation between productive credit and speculative activity. Number two, a fixed exchange rate relationship between and among those participating national currencies and the new currency. Floating exchange rates have been a tool of financial speculators since August 1971. That is when Nixon decoupled the dollar from the gold reserve. And they are anathema to long-term trade and investment cooperation among sovereign nations. Number three, productive credit must be issued in that new currency to finance great development projects with a heavy emphasis on science and advanced technologies in and among participating nations to quickly boost the physical economies and thereby provide the only possible solid backing for the value and stability of the new currency. Think Alexander Hamilton. We will get back to Alexander Hamilton in a few minutes. Now, <clears throat> when I woke up this morning, their news headlines were screaming about a combined Chinese-Russian naval flotilla that had come dangerously close to the shores of Alaska. Well, in fact, um, what had occurred was that a combined Chinese-Russian flotilla conducted maneuvers in the Sea of Japan and then headed out to the Western Pacific. And this is upsetting many uh, Alaskan representatives and, of course, the neocons. And th there, there's this anti-Russia China drumbeat throughout the Congress right now, which is just completely insane. Um, so Dan Sullivan told Fox News, a uh, senator from, from Alaska, this is unprecedented in terms of the size and scope of this joint naval task force between Russia and China working very closely together. Whether you live in Alaska like I do or on the east coast of the United States, a very large surface action task force between our two main adversaries probing very closely to the United States shores is concerning. <clears throat> and he applauds the fact that we just sent four destroyers and a P-8A patrol aircraft. He says that's a lot of naval power up here demonstrating American resolve. And he goes on to call on the Biden administration to broadly meet the needs and get serious about a robust defense budget. You know, I mean, we're almost at a trillion bucks a year, so I don't know how much more robust we can get. Uh, this is a stark reminder of Alaska's proximity to both China and Russia, as well as the essential role our state plays in our national defense and territorial sovereignty, Lisa Murkowski, the other Alaska senator, chimed in. Okay. Cooler heads are speaking out. Pentagon spokesman Pat Ryder tamped down some of the hysteria, and he said they were in international waters. At no time were they deemed to pose a threat. And so like any country, they are free to conduct exercises in international airspace, international waters. We will continue to monitor, but, you know, I think it's no surprise to anyone that China and Russia continue to look at ways to cooperate and will continue to monitor this situation and act appropriately. So that's what he says. Now, we are coming off a series of rallies across the planet. Um, I was very fortunate to be at the rally at the United Nations for the International Peace Coalition and the LaRouche Organization is a proud sponsor of these rallies and, and the work of the IPC. Um, <clears throat> I want to let you know that the LaRouche Organization will be pulling together essential history uh, on the topics that are critical to understand the real issues of the day. Uh, on the YouTube channel, on our YouTube channel right now, you can find our documentary, The Revival of the American System with Chinese Characteristics, and we'll put the link to that in the bio as well. We will soon be producing a video on the historic friendship of the U.S. and Russia. In point of fact, the United States, Russia, and China have been friends much longer than we have been enemies. <clears throat> now, in light of this situation in Alaska, I would ask you to consider... 
that in 1863, when Tsar Alexander II sent his Pacific fleet under Admiral Popov to San Francisco and his Atlantic fleet to New York under Adam, uh, Admiral Lesovsky, this was an action taken in defense of the United States Republic against the British and French colonial powers who at that time were threatening to recognize the Confederacy and thereby break the United States Republic apart permanently. And they were even courting the Russians to join with them in this recognition. And Alexander II said, not only absolutely not, but that would be a causus belli against you, France and England. So, when these uh, armadas showed up in San Francisco and New York, the American people rejoiced. They rejoiced. There were celebrations for months, literally. Um, Cassius Marcellus Clay, Abraham Lincoln's ambassador to Russia, had brought the American system works of the Hamiltonian, Henry Carey, with him to St. Petersburg. Uh, so these works were, were spread throughout Russia. <clears throat> and as the Tsar freed the serfs and Lincoln freed the slaves, the transcontinental, and then later under Alexander III, the son of Tsar Alexander II, the Trans-Siberian Railroad was built. Development was bringing nations together. And this development could free the world from the British Empire system and from war. So um, the, the idea of this was th there was an eye for cooperation between the United States, Russia, China, Mexico as well under Juarez. Lincoln understood this. Alexander II understood this. They understood who the enemy was. It was the British Empire and the Empire system. Both were assassinated. And in fact, the, those assassins who managed to escape uh, in the Lincoln assassination escaped to Canada and then to London. Now, it is now time that we finish the work of Abraham Lincoln and Alexander II. And we join together with Russia, China, other nations for that economic development that will free the world from the empire system. The question is, why doesn't the United States rediscover its soul and purpose and join with the BRICS nations and put that empire system out of business once and for all? Thank you for listening and join us again tomorrow.